This is a 1977 Cadillac Eldorado Barretz. Back in the 1970s, the premier luxury car brand in the world, aside from Rolls-Royce and Bentley, was not Lexus or BMW or Mercedes-Benz. It was Cadillac, and this was the premier Cadillac, the top of the line model, the best Cadillac you could buy 40 years ago. It's also one of the most delightfully bizarre, quirky, weird cars I've ever reviewed. And today, I'm gonna give you a tour of it. I borrowed this Eldorado from Maury's Heritage Car Connection here in Minneapolis. Think of them as an exotic and vintage rental car company where you can rent cars just like this one instead of a normal boring Malibu from Enterprise. Before I go any further, I have to show you around this thing and show you all of its quirks and features because from the perspective of someone living in 2017, this car is just insane. And then, as usual, I'm going to drive it and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. I'm going to start with the most impressive quirk of this car, namely its size. Excuse me while I take a trip all the way to the back. This car is 225 inches in length, which means it is the same length as a Chevy Suburban. It is two and a half feet longer than a Ford Explorer. It weighs in at 4,900 pounds. You're thinking, well, that's ridiculous that a two-door car would have such an enormous size. But something you may not have realized, open this up and this thing can seat six passengers. So if you wanted to, you could use it like a Ford Explorer. So you're thinking, car this big, this long, this heavy, must have something gigantic under the hood. And you're right, this car does have a huge engine. In fact, it has a 7-liter V8, which followed up on the previous model's 8.2-liter V8. Now, as you know, General Motors has used a 7-liter V8 recently in the Corvette Z06, where it made over 500 horsepower. This car, hampered by emissions regulations, makes only 180 horsepower, which is not all that much from 7 liters. <laughs> I'm going to start this with this giant door that is so massive and so heavy, thanks to all this leather and glass, that you wouldn't be able to lift it if it wasn't attached to the car. Now, the most interesting thing about this door is this exterior mounted thermometer mounted at the base of the outside mirror. It has the Cadillac logo on it. And the idea is that you're sitting in the driver's seat, and you glance over, and it tells you what temperature it is outside. Amazingly, it even works. And maybe even more amazingly, this isn't the only piece of exterior equipment on this car that provides you with data. The other exterior feature that provides you with information in this car, far more bizarre than that thermometer, these things. There's one on each fender. If you've ever seen one of these on an old car and you didn't know what it does, well, here's what it does. When you put on your turn signal, this thing lights up to show you in the driver's seat that your turn signal's on. When you put on your headlights, a different light in here lights up to show you that your headlights are on. And when you put on your brights, a third light, a completely different color, lights up to show you that your brights are on. It's actually kind of ingenious, but at the same time, I've never seen like this before. But back to the giant door. It is so heavy and it opens so wide so that people can get into the back that it has to have a handle on it. Not just any handle, a finely finished wood handle that is hinged so that when you go to open it, you can just pull and ensconce yourself in the luxury of the Cadillac, assuming that you are strong enough to actually close the door. This car also has another interesting door handle situation. Namely, if you want to get out and you're sitting in the front seat, obviously you just pull the door handle, you open the door and you get out. But this car's door is so big that it also has a rear door handle for the rear passengers if they want to get out. So there's two separate handles on this door that unlatch it so that people inside can get out. Now once you climb inside this car, you are confronted with maybe the best thing about the entire Eldorado, the pillowy seats. And I don't just mean they're sort of pillowy, I mean this car has pillows mounted on top of the seats. Two on each seat, bottom and back, front and rear, eight total pillows in this car which is more than I have on my bed. Now, I mentioned earlier that this car could seat six people, and it can. There are two bench seats in this car, three people in the back, three people in the front. Now, the weird thing about the front setup is that the seats are power in the front, and they're split, even though a middle person is supposed to go here. So theoretically, the driver could put their seat all the way forward, the passenger could put their seat all the way back, and then the person who's stuck in the middle seat would sort of be half on one seat and half on the other in this weird angle configuration. It's very strange, but so is this car. Now, maybe the strangest thing about this car is all of its controls, which are really bizarre. For example, the climate control. In a normal car, anybody can adjust the climate control. It's right in the middle. You want it colder on this side, hotter, whatever. 
not in this car. In this car, the climate control is on the left of the steering wheel, which means it's only the purview of the driver. The passenger can ask nicely, and the driver can decide if he wants to accommodate the passenger's climate change request. Next up, let's talk about the control for the mirrors. Now, in your car, there's probably a little switch over on the driver's door panel, and you move a little thing, and that adjusts where the mirror is. And that's true in this car also, except that little switch on the door panel only adjust the driver's mirror. If you want to adjust the passenger mirror, there is an unlabeled switch right above the defogger behind the steering wheel, and you move that around and that adjusts the passenger mirror. Now, this is purely mechanical. These things you adjust them even when the car is off because when you adjust it, there's probably a little cable inside that actually moves the mirror where you're pulling it. Next up, let's talk about how to control the windshield wipers. Now, I've seen a lot of weird controls in a lot of cars, but this windshield wiper control might just take the cake. Now, in your car, it's probably a little stock that comes out of the steering column. You push it, the windshield wiper's gone, it's easy. In this car, there's a little L-shaped track to the left of the steering wheel, and there's a little switch inside it. You move the switch along the little L to activate the windshield wipers. And how do you not love the interior turn signal indicators in this car? In addition to those little things on the hood that let you know when your turn signal is on, the little indicators indicators in the gauge cluster in this car are also kind of cool. They're not dinky little arrows like in modern cars. Instead, they're just giant green triangles pointing in the direction you're going to turn. I love them. Another interesting control in this car, you want to turn on the headlights, that's easy. Just turn a little dial located on the left of the steering column. That's how it is still in normal cars today. You want to turn on the brights in this car? Well, that's easy too. Just push a little button with your left foot located in the footwell. I'm told this is actually pretty common for older cars like this, but I've never seen it before, and I can't imagine why they thought that was a better idea than placing it virtually anywhere else. Another interesting thing about this car, this car can seat six, but of course it would be most comfortable for four. Cadillac knows that, and that's why they fitted it with four ashtrays, one for each individual who can sit in the car. Personal ashtrays. Ah, the 70s. Now, moving on from the interior controls, you look at the rest of this car, and you just say, oh, it's a normal 70s car. How quirky could it possibly be? Well, you're in for a treat. I'll start with the horn. Boy, that's obnoxious, but it fits with the character of the car, wouldn't you say? Now, moving along to the back, you'll notice that there is no fuel door on the driver's side of this car, and there is no fuel door on the passenger side of this car. That's because the fuel door is hidden back here underneath the license plate. Now, this was actually pretty common in 70s cars, putting the fuel door underneath the license plate. What was less common was the trunk opening and closing situation. Now, opening the trunk was a little bit quirky. You moved aside your little Cadillac crest so that you could get verification of how cool you were every time you jumped into the trunk. And you put your key in, you turned it, and then the trunk popped right open. But that wasn't the craziest thing about the trunk situation. The most interesting thing about the trunk came when it was time to close it. You took the trunk, you shut it most of the way, and then the trunk does the rest. Now, a lot of cars today have auto soft closing doors that does exactly that, but this was 40 years ago, and that was pretty cool at the time. And we're not even close to being done with all the weird exterior quirks of this car. Now, front lighting, tail lights, those are all pretty normal. What wasn't quite so normal is back here on the vinyl top, this little light mounted behind the window. Why is it there? For decoration. And when you turn on the headlights, that light goes on. I don't really know why. To illuminate the side of the car so that other people know you're driving an Eldorado? Speaking of unusual lighting, this car has something called cornering lights, which is a little strange. A few modern cars have this today, but in case you haven't seen it, it is worth noting. When you're driving along, you put on your turn signal, and you're going to make a turn. The car knows that, so it also turns on a little light, like the headlights, on the side of the car to illuminate the left or right, depending on which turn signal you put on. That way, your path is a little brighter as you make your turn. Some other things I like about the exterior of this car, the car on both front and back, it ends. And then after that, Cadillac tacked on some other stuff in some sort of strange material. And then after that, Cadillac tacked on some chrome. After the car ends on both sides, there's about a foot more car. Only Cadillac in the 70s did that kind of stuff. And in that same vein, I mentioned that this car is 224 inches long, but check this out. The wheelbase, that's the distance from the center of the front wheel to the center of the back wheel, that's only 124 inches. That means that this car has eight and a half feet of car outside the axles. You'll never see that again in any car ever, except maybe the Lincoln that competed with this at the time. Another thing I like about this car is the Cadillac Reef and Crest hood ornament. Now, apparently at the time this car was being sold, there was a problem with hood ornament theft. People stole them and then they mounted them on their wall like trophies. So Cadillac made this one impossible to steal. Check this out.
And then finally, we have to discuss the rear reflector, which actually says El Dorado on it in rather nice lettering. In fact, it's even raised up on the reflector, as if it could be a reflector from any other car, since it's like a foot long. Okay, so that's all the weird quirks and the cool features of the 1977 Cadillac Eldorado Barretts. Now, before I drive this Chevy Suburban-sized coupe on the road, a little history lesson. Yes, this car really did exist in a time when Cadillac was the world standard for luxury cars. Young people today don't really realize it, but BMW at one point made crappy little cars like this, and Mercedes made crappy little cars like this. When this car came out in 1977, Lexus wouldn't even exist for another 13 years. At the time, what people wanted was opulent, comfortable luxury cruisers like this. Then came the fuel crisis, emissions regulations, fuel economy rules, higher gas prices, and Cadillac couldn't get away with making a Chevy Suburban-sized two-door car that got 9.4 miles per gallon. Overnight, the Eldorado became obsolete, and European and Japanese luxury cars swooped in for the kill. Anyway, time to drive this thing, and don't forget to click the link below to go to autotrader.com slash oversteer, where I've got more of my thoughts on driving this 40-year-old luxury barge, and I've got a list of cars that don't quite recapture their former glory, sort of like the later Eldorado models. Anyway, time to get on the road. All right, so I gotta back this thing up, huh? I have literally no idea what is going on at any point, nor do I, the mirrors are so small. <laughs> This car is 20 feet long, seriously, 20 feet long, and the mirrors have got to be, they're like this. Here goes, we're driving this thing. God, it's just massive. It's incredible that you're controlling all of this. <laughs> I, feel like I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm driving a condominium. Well, first off, <laughs> the Cadillac logo out in the front, I mean, you just got this giant Cadillac hood ornament out there. It's just huge, and it's 10, 12 feet in front of you. It is incredible just how much vehicle I'm piloting. And the really incredible part is I actually can't see anything behind me, but I know it goes on for just as long back there. I can't believe, I mean, people driving this thing around must have just been the most ostentatious, annoying bastards of the 1970s. And people say cars feel like a boat. I mean, that's the stupidest thing. If anybody says that about a modern car, they're just being an idiot. They're, they're using cliches for the sake of you. This car feels like a bow. This car, I, first off, you can move the steering wheel about 12 inches before the turning process begins. And I say the turning process because it doesn't really start to turn. It just sort of starts to waft in the general direction that you're turning the wheel. Starts to. And then if you do it some more, it continues. And I mean, it's connected to the wheels, but, but only vaguely. Now, there's no sense of urgency in this car, which is kind of nice. The seats are just tremendously pillowy, soft, plush, comfortable. It is just a wonderful seating experience. I love it. Of course, they don't have a headrest. That, they hadn't come up with that technology yet. They decided to put, the seats are like pillows. They literally have pillows on top of them. But the headrest wasn't there, so I can just kind of stick my head back. Of course, if I get hit from behind, I do one of those and then I break my neck or something. I, I'm not about to sit here and say I don't like this car. People who have them are crazy, but <laughs> you got to admit, it's, it, it, it captures a certain time uh, in America, in Cadillac, in the car industry. That's kind of cool. And, and if I had an 80 car garage, this would be one. And I would drive it a couple times a year. And I would just think it's the coolest thing in the world. And, and, and it would be fun to have. And in the 70s, when most cars were crap and getting tiny and carbureted and crappy and, and poorly constructed, this thing would have felt so nice, comfy and pillowy. And, and you were driving sort of an expression of yourself in this car. As the 70s, the Chevette and all these stupid cars that were tiny and stupid and ugly, and this car would have been like, yeah, yeah, I got my caddy. But it feels just tremendously, just, you, I, I, this is one of those cars where you sit in the right lane, people go by you and they're, oh, I'm, I'm commuting in my Explorer, I got my kids, we're going to soccer practice, we have to get there. And you're just like, yeah, whatever, I don't care. I'm just chilling. But you have to turn the wheel, oh God, we just went over a bump and the whole car kind of realigns itself on the road, like, what? Oh, this is nice. It's so nice, so comfortable. It really does remind me a lot of that Wraith that I, Rolls Royce, the new Rolls Royce Wraith that I drove. Uh, it feels kind of like that, in the sense that it's just a cocoon. All right, crap, oh my God, I didn't realize how slow it would be. I made a right on red, that was a mistake. Here's a Sienna who's going by me. I'm gonna catch up, 50, 
55, we're making it, yes! There was absolutely no pretense of sport in this car. It liked the Rolls Royces. There was no attempt. You know, a lot of cars today, oh, we're luxury and we're sporty and we're this. This car was just luxury. There was no like, oh no, we got a sport version. No. <laughs> By modern standards, it's terrible, right? It's slow and the steering is awful and, and the braking is bad and the use of space in the interior is laughable. I mean, the car is 24 feet long and I'm, my knee is hitting up against the steering column here and they didn't even have to contend with safety. What, what was taking up so much space? But the thing is, it's just cool. <laughs> it's just cool. These, these 70s Eldorados don't sell for that much. Uh, but I bet one day they start to become a little bit more highly regarded. It's, it's an experience as cars become more technologically advanced and smaller and, and, and more user friendly and all that. This is an experience that most people will, will not get to have anymore, ever, in any car. So that's the 1977 Cadillac Eldorado Barretts, one of the most opulent luxury cars you could buy 40 years ago. Basically, the Mercedes S-Class Coupe of its day. It's not fast, it's not fun, but it's majestic and supremely comfortable. And from the perspective of someone 40 years later, it's really, really weird and quirky. Now, it's time to give it a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, some people hate how this car looks and some people love it. I personally can see both sides and I can't justify calling it either beautiful or ugly, so it gets a 5 out of 10. Next up is acceleration. The Eldorado does 0 to 60 in 9 point something seconds, giving it a 1 out of 10. Handling is truly terrible, really awful with massive body roll and vagueness in the steering. It's just one step shy of being actually dangerous, so it earns a 2 out of 10. Cool factor is very debatable, and I know a lot of people think this era of Eldorado is too constrained by emissions regulations to be really cool, but I think it's cool enough to get a 7 out of 10. Finally, importance, which is basically, would you put this car in a museum? Earlier Eldorado models may be more indicative of Cadillac's golden years, but this car showed a different face, the end of an era among giant, showy American cars. It easily earns a 6 out of 10, bringing its total weekend score to 21 out of 50. Next, for the daily categories, I start with features. This car had a lot of features for its time, but this category judges cars by modern standards, and this one is way off the mark. Lane departure warning? Uh, no, but if you want an ashtray, the Eldorado's got you covered. And for that reason, it still ekes out a 2 out of 10. Next up is luxury, which mainly measures comfort. The Eldorado is one of the most comfortable cars I've ever driven, but it's hampered by poor visibility, bringing its potential 9 down to an 8 out of 10. Quality measures materials and reliability. I'm told reliability is good, largely on account of the fact that it's fairly simple mechanically, but quality is certainly a bit dubious. It earns a 5 out of 10. For practicality, the trunk is enormous, easily enough to earn a 5 in this category, and the car seats 6, which helps its case. But Fuel economy is truly horrendous, and then there's the matter of parking a 20-foot-long car. Not exactly very practical, so it earns a 4 out of 10. Finally, there's value. These things aren't fast, they aren't exciting to drive, and they aren't rare, so they probably shouldn't be worth much, but they're kind of cool, at least to me, and their current pricing, you can easily get one for under $10,000, is a good deal for such a unique automotive experience. That gives it a 6 out of 10, bringing its total daily score to 25 out of 50. The only time a 77 Eldorado will ever beat out a Ferrari F40 in anything. Anyway, add it all up and the total Doug score is 46 out of 100, placing it near the bottom among cars I've scored. It's also tied with the 2005 Maserati Quattroporte, which says everything you need to know about the 2005 Maserati Quattroporte.